Scattered about the oceans of the world, you might find this. This is a hydrophone. Microphones designed to pick up sound underwater. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has hundreds of these deployed throughout the oceans of the world. Think of it like a deep sea surveillance system, just in case those blue whales start getting any crazy ideas. And most of the time that's all they hear. You know, whale calls, dolphins, passing ships, seismic activity in some places, but not always. There have, in fact, been numerous sounds recorded in the oceans around the world that defy explanation, including one in 1997 that was the loudest underwater sound ever recorded. A sound that, for a while anyway, stupefied scientists around the world and led to an array of questions about what exactly was down there. If you didn't already know, 97% of the world's water is found in the ocean. Because of that, it has a massive impact on the world's weather, its temperature, and its food supply. But it still remains a mystery. In fact, more than 80% of it has never been explored. Explored, mapped, or even seen by humans. While we currently know about 226,000 ocean species, there may well be up to more than 90% of the ocean species we still don't know about yet. Some scientists suggest that there could be between a few hundred thousand to a few million more to be discovered. And there are a lot of species that we thought went extinct and then found out later that, nope. <laughs> They're still out there. Maybe the most famous example is the coelacanth, a fish that was thought to have gone extinct 65 million years ago. But then one was caught off the South African coast in 1938, and scientists around the world went, whoa! That's what scientists do. And then there's a symbiotic relationship between two marine life forms that were thought to have been extinct for 273 million years. Yeah, scientists published a paper in 2021 that said that they found non-skeletal corals growing from the stalks of marine animals called crinoids, or sea lilies. They discovered these on the Pacific Ocean floor off the coast of Japan. And then there's everybody's favorite oversized cephalopod, the giant squid. For years, the only reason we knew they existed at all was because from time to time, a giant carcass would wash up on a beach somewhere. But scientists had never actually seen one in the wild. That changed in 2012, when a group of scientists from Japan's National Science Museum filmed a giant squid in its natural habitat for the first time. Although they almost caught one in 2006, when researchers suspended bait uh, under a ship off the coast of Japan to try to hook one, and it managed to get the bait, but it did it without getting hooked. Because cephalopods are scary smart. I actually talked about cephalopods once before on this channel, in one of the greatest scripts of the 21st century, written by one of the world's most thought-provoking script writers, playwrights, and rocket. Oh, this is Jason's script, isn't it? Ah, Jason got me. He got me. Little scamp. Anyway, the ocean is big and mysterious, which is why Noah built that hydrophone array I was talking about earlier. Uh, a little bit of how hydrophones work, in case you're wondering, most are based on the piezoelectricity of certain ceramics that create tiny electrical currents when faced with pressure changes. After submerging them in the ocean, ceramic hydrophones produce small voltage signals over a wide frequency range when they're exposed to underwater sounds coming from any direction. And when we amplify and record those signals, the sea sounds can be measured precisely. And when we deploy several hydrophones in an array, we can kind of triangulate the sounds by when they hit each hydrophone to figure out what direction they came from and how far away they are. The U.S. Navy used sonoboys for decades to record the sounds of enemy submarines, usually deployed from an aircraft or a ship. They've also been used in the past to record marine mammal calls and listen for earthquake activity. But their short lifespan kind of keeps them from being a long-term monitoring solution for recording ocean sounds. But anyway, this is one of the best ways we have so far to monitor what's going on in this vast expanse of ocean, because sound waves do travel a lot further in water than they do in air. So there's a lot we can discern from listening to the sounds that we record. And over time, researchers have accumulated a vast library of sounds. So, you know, what might just sound like a bunch of noise to us is pretty recognizable to them. So when they record something that doesn't fit any of their models, it's something they pay attention to. Which brings us to the bloop. Researchers were listening for underwater volcanic activity in the Southern Pacific Ocean in 1997 when they recorded an extremely loud, powerful, and strange sound. With hydrophones placed more than 3,219 kilometers apart across the Pacific Ocean, they were able to record the sound several times in several places. Scientists at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environment Lab uh, wanted to discover where the sound came from, but the problem was, it was so loud, they didn't even know where to start. Like I was just saying, normally a sound can be triangulated by a handful of hydrophones, but as the director of the acoustics program at NOAA told Vice in 2017, quote, it's unusual when a sound is recorded on all the sensors we have deployed. If it's a ship or a whale, when it makes a sound in the ocean, it isn't big enough to be recorded all the way across the Pacific. But this sound was recorded on many hydrophones, so it stood out in our mind as being something unique. And with nothing else to go on, researchers decided to just call it the bloop. And here's why. Okay. 
I gotta say, you uh, can't deny its bloopiness. So when word got out about this mysterious sound, it, of course, led to mountains of speculation. One theory was that it might be underwater military exercises, but none were reported to be going on that day. Of course, it wouldn't be reported if it was a secret military exercise or if it was some kind of secret military technology, huh? 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 <laughs> some people suggested it might be a giant squid, but squids and cephalopods don't really make sounds. Unless it's some kind of undiscovered species of squids, huh? <laughs> or maybe it's Cthulhu. Seriously, some people think it might actually be Cthulhu. For those less literate in the audience, Cthulhu is a fictional creature imagined by H.P. Lovecraft in his story, The Call of Cthulhu, which, to be fair, this sound was recorded about 1,500 kilometers from the spot where the creature first emerged in his story, so, uh, that is kind of weird. Other theories about what might be making this sound include a huge chemical reaction on the sea floor, an interaction of powerful ocean currents, and mermaid screaming. <laughs> Let's call that last one a maybe. And of course, we've got the alien theories, advanced underwater species, all out of the abyss, an Atlantean civilization. Basically, any movie that involves the ocean has been used to explain it. But maybe the idea that's gained the most interest is the idea that it's, it's some kind of giant undiscovered ocean creature, like a, a cryptid of some kind. And people have put a lot of thought into this, like even speculating on biologies based on the sound and, and you know, what, what it would take to make that kind of vocalization. Some designs show it as being a gargantuan creature several times larger than a blue whale. Some speculate that it might be more like a regular whale size but has some super efficient mechanism by which to create sound, like, like the pistol shrimp, which is only a couple inches long, but can create sound, you know, loud enough to stun a prey. But then there's this write-up from Alphapedia, which I'm just gonna read to you. The bloop's frontal part of the body is large and similar in shape to a shark, but its behind tail part gets thinner like that of a stingray. Its limbs seem to be not fins, but rather large webbed tubes which propel it through the water with massive strides. The front of its face is an odd nose-like bulb which increases the frequency of its powerful song so that it can nearly cause human heads to explode on contact. The creature's top half actually moves differently from its back half. The front moves like a whale and the back moves more like a saltwater crocodile. And look, the ocean is huge and mostly undiscovered, so thinking this is some kind of giant sea creature isn't that far-fetched. For example, the call of a blue whale can reach up to 180 decibels. That's as loud as a jet plane. They can also make calls at 14 hertz, which is a frequency well below our hearing ability. These low frequency sounds travel further with less distortion, transmission loss, and scattering. This means blue whales can communicate with each other over thousands of kilometers. But there's a twist in the unsolved mystery of the bloop. And that twist is, it's actually been solved. We've known what it is for a long time. So over the years, NOAA has deployed hydrophone arrays closer and closer to Antarctica to, to study the sound of seafloor earthquakes and volcanoes around that area. And in 2005, that's when they finally discovered the bloop source. It was the sound of an ice quake, which is an iceberg cracking and breaking away from the Antarctic glacier. Kind of anticlimactic, of course, you know, when you think about it, or more frightening if you're concerned about climate change. I mean, this isn't really about climate change, though climate change is causing glaciers to crack and break apart more often. So ice quakes are actually called cryoseisms, which might be my new favorite word. And the way they work is that, that water in the ground often freezes really quickly, which makes it expand. And when it expands too much, it breaks up the soil surrounding it, creating cracks in the ground. So when temperatures drop at night, that top layer of slush freezes too quickly, and then the water underneath the slush requires more time to freeze. Once it freezes again, it expands, which causes the slush to crack, causing an ice quake. But like I said before, the bloop is not the only mysterious sea sound that we've recorded. There are actually several unexplained sounds from the ocean that we still don't know what's making them. Like there's the upsweep. It consists of a long train of sounds that sweep repeatedly upwards, creating a howl from low to high frequencies. NOAA first detected it in the Pacific Ocean in 1991. The weird thing is that it actually changes throughout the year and it peaks in the spring and fall. But scientists aren't sure if this is because there are changes in the source or if the environment the sound travels through changes. One possible explanation for this is undersea volcanoes. Um, maybe the sounds come from hot lava pouring out into the cold ocean water and solidifying. And while it's still detectable, its noise level has been slowly declining since its discovery. But here's what it sounds like. <laughs> The whistle is another sound that may have come from volcanic activity. Recorded just once in the Pacific Ocean in 1997, researchers haven't been able to pinpoint the source. You need three microphones for that, and only one microphone picked up this sound. I said microphone, hydrophone, but here's what that one sounds like. In 1999, Noah recorded the Julia sound. 
Uh, it was so loud that the entire Equatorial Pacific Ocean Autonomous Hydrophone Array heard it. That was a lot of words. Uh, the sound lasted just under three minutes. Its most likely source was a large iceberg that ran aground off Antarctica with its point of origin somewhere between the Bransfield Straits and Cape Adair. And I'm not gonna play the whole three minute clip, but here's what that sounded like. Another sound that could have come from an iceberg running aground was called slow down. First recorded in 1997, the sound decreased in frequency over seven minutes. While an iceberg running aground is still one hypothesis, another is that the sound of, it's the sound of ice moving over land in Antarctica. And let's hear that slow down. And then there's the train, which was recorded in 1997 on the Eastern Equatorial Pacific Autonomous Hydrophone Array. It was a steady sound of about 32 to 35 hertz, uh, and it was most likely a large iceberg grounding itself off the Ross Sea near Cape Adair. I want to end by talking about another sound that we've recorded that we actually know its origin, but it doesn't make it any less mysterious. We're sad. This one's kind of sad. It's called the 52 Hertz Whale. It's also known as the world's loneliest whale. <laughs> Get those tissues out, guys. Researchers at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution heard the whale sound in 1989. It was unusual because it came in at 52 Hertz, which is actually really high for a whale species. The institution wrote in a report in 2000 that, quote, this sound source has been the only one with this call structure in the entire listening area. We've been tracking this call since 1992 and have not identified the whale species. So they think it might actually be a hybrid whale. And there could be good news. Um, it may not actually be as lonely as we think. Whales in different areas have different dialects, so its sound may be recognized by other blue whales. Christopher Clark, director of bioacoustics research program at Cornell, told Smithsonian Magazine in 2015 that, quote, the animal's singing with a lot of the same features of a typical blue whale song. Blue whales, fin whales, and humpback whales, all these whales can hear this guy. They're not deaf. He's just odd. There's an idea for a children's book about this whale somewhere. What's not odd is our unique ability to turn toward wild theories when something is mysterious. You know, somebody doesn't like the sunlight, must be a vampire. Hear a weird sound in your attic, it must be a stranger living up there that you don't know about. Can only see a straight line on the horizon, the world must be flat. And massive worldwide conspiracy. Top Gun Maverick got nominated for Best Picture Award. Scientologists are clearly tallying the votes. Mysteries are fun. They're exciting. That's why I talk about them on this channel all the time. You know, they engage both sides of our brains, but they can also be a bit of a letdown sometimes when they're solved. Because like I always say, the simplest answer is usually the most likely. Like a lot of people wanted to believe that the bloop was a mythical sea creature created by a horror writer's imagination. But it's that imagination that frankly, I think is actually kind of cool. Look, I've made no secret on this channel that I'm not really into conspiracy theories and I tend to hit the woo-woo alarm on cryptozoology and that kind of thing, but, but I love the creativity that people show and, you know, trying to figure out how creatures like this might exist. It's an exercise in speculative biology, like, like how we imagine aliens might look like or how they might live on other worlds. Like, I'll shout out my buddy Andy Weir. Um, you know, the way he conceptualized the Rocky character in Project Hail Mary, um, we talked about it on my podcast, shameless plug, but it, it just blew my mind, like the, the level of thinking that he put into that stuff. It's just, it's really cool to me. And with the suspected 80 to 90% of the ocean species still to be discovered, especially when you consider what we've already found at the depths of the ocean, which are just mind blowing, you know, um, there's a lot of room for that kind of thinking to be applied to the bloop or any of these other sounds. And why not? It's fun. So yeah, the ocean is big and full of terrors, but you know what's really terrifying? the money you're spending on shaving. There's a reason why a whole industry shifted to selling these cartridge razors, and it ain't because they're making less money off of it. But one company is out to change that model, and that's today's sponsor, Henson Shaving. With Henson, you spend money once on a precision engineered razor made out of aerospace-grade aluminum on aerospace-grade equipment, and that's pretty much it. You get this beautifully designed razor engineered to support a single blade all the way across to the depth of only 27 microns at a perfect 30 degree angle. So it's basically impossible to get a bad shave meaning there's zero chance of the razor skipping across your skin, which they call chatter, and which is why these other blades cause so much irritation. But after you buy the razor, the blades are only 10 cents each. Compare that to $2 each for one of these guys, and you can see why you're saving money after less than six months. And actually, if you go to hensonshaving.com slash joescott and enter the code joescott at checkout, you can get this 100 pack of blades totally for free. Just make sure you add it to your order. And in case you're wondering, you can shave between five to seven times with these blades before replacing them. So even if you shave every day, that's, that's like a year and a half of free blades. Like check out this chart, okay? By the time you're done with all these blades, 
you'll have already saved over $100. And if you only shave every other day or so like I do, you'll have a flying car by the time you're done with these. It all just makes sense. I use it myself. I like it a lot. So go take a look for yourself. It'll save you money. You'll get a great shave. It supports a really cool company and it helps support this channel. And it's more sustainable. Shall I go on? So once again, it's hensonshaving.com slash Joe Scott, promo code Joe Scott at checkout. Linky poo in the doobly doo. Big thanks to the answer files on Patreon and the channel members who are helping to support this channel. Uh, just being awesome people and uh, forming a really cool community. If you don't know, there's a Discord that's only available to Patreon people. A lot of really cool stuff is going on there. Um, I got some new people to shout out real quick. We've got Drew Mazak, Ali and Bill Quinn, Kenneth Flinchbaugh, <laughs> Andreas Krashner, here we go, uh, Mac McIntyre, Rats Zab, uh, Michelle Hamill, Scott Kelly, Kevin C. Sullivan, Kylie Ungewitter, uh, Catherine Burnside and Jim Kido. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos um, and access to exclusive live streams and Zoom calls. And again, just be part of a really cool community. Just go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. T-shirts and another merch is available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash store. Um, you can get stuff with my branded stuff on it if you like, or there's all kinds of really fun uh, T-shirts which is cool nerdy stuff that people look at and go, ah, that's cool. There's some really great stuff on there. Answer the Joe.com slash store. Help support the channel. Go check it out. And that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you in two Mondays. Yeah. <laughs> Love you guys. Take care.